Good morning. Good morning. Wonder if you can hear me okay? Yes, very good. Uh, we want to welcome you on behalf of the family to the celebration of life, this memorial for Dr. Arthur Lee. Just a quick reminder to silence your cell phones if you've not done so already. That would be quite interesting. Just turn it off. On behalf of the family, I'd like to welcome you here this morning to celebrate the life of a great friend, a great father, son, brother, someone we all deeply appreciated and cherished. And so it's fitting that we spend this time together in his memory, together with the memories that we bring, and especially with the comfort that comes from Arthur's faith. As we begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear the promise of Christ our Lord. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Let us pray. Merciful Father, the generations rise and pass away before you. You are the strength of those who labor and the repose of the blessed dead. We give you thanks for all you have lived for all who have lived and died in the faith, especially for Arthur, our dear brother. His body you gave him life and poured out your Holy Spirit when you washed him in the renewing waters of holy baptism. By the same Spirit, you led him to confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe with his heart that you have raised Christ from the dead. Give us faith to commend our brother to you, to await with confidence the resurrection of all your saints, living and departing, Christ, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. As we hear this hymn, uh, let us take a moment to reflect, especially on the word sung, to lift our minds and hearts to heaven and contemplate the very things that Arthur contemplated.
Bill, Christine. Technology. That was English enough. I was about to get very English. <laughs> Bill, now you can hear me. Christine, Teresa, sisters, or dear brother, family and friends, all. Grace, mercy, and peace. You too, from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I bring you greetings from brothers and sisters at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Wartburg, Tennessee, of which I'm privileged to be its pastor and at the place that Arthur called his spiritual home. At this memorial today, we'll hear from many about their recollections, memories, good times, cherished moments, and other, I am sure fun and amusing anecdotes about Arthur. Those stories, those memories, they are for you to share. Didn't know he was such a big Beatles fan, so to quote John Lennon, that's for you to share, not me. I'm just I'm just the songwriter guy, you know, I'm just the guy. I'm just I'm just his pastor and song through that dimension. A fuller picture of who he is. That's for you to share with us today. Because Arthur was much more than his vocation, his relationships, his family. He was, as we all are, much more than all of that. We are a full person with everything that goes with it. One perspective would be unfair to capture him today and would be woefully lacking. Several will be sharing their stories that will help fill that picture out. Yet that, this moment, it's not my role. Instead, we'll take this time to find comfort, healing, and I truly hope some peace, not only for his children, but for all who love To find healing, though, we must face what we all know and what wounds all who love Arthur. To be healed, we need to address the wounds. We come today in the midst of not only death, but tragedy. We come today with many questions and unknowns. We come with uncertainty and confusion, seeking some measure of sense to put the picture together. There are certainly many feelings that surround the nature of Arthur leaving us, but Arthur does not. Or, but Arthur does leave behind a comfort that goes beyond any memory, that transcends any logic we try and assign to this memorial today. Arthur, I am sure, would want above all this piece of assurance to be left with you, that you too may find comfort. Arthur was one I truly felt comfortable talking to. He was a man of intellect, and that he valued above all else. I loved asking him about geology and also talking eBay sales, many things he sold for me. He was amazing at it. He was the best. Made me some money. It was pretty cool what he could do. Yet he would return the fair by asking questions of the faith, and I and that I dearly love to speak about with him. Arthur was a man of faith. He was one who valued it in his life, and when I met him, I was rather vexed about not receiving baptism. He was unsure if it happened when he was young, so after some investigation, knowing it never took place, he insisted that he would be baptized. I was happy to do that for him on August 15th of last year, the, fe the Feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was a gift that he received gladly, and it was my joy to have a part in it. It's also a gift that transcends our decisions and actions. It is something that we hold on to when nothing else we do seems to work or make sense. It is valid even when we do not treat it well or live up to it. It is the promise that God gives. He alone that connects us to him it is that light in us when all else seems dark. This promise is indeed valid for Arthur and always was even until his last moment. That last moment, though, leaves us with a lot of trauma. What were his thoughts? Possible to say. What were his last words? Also possible to say. Yet it isn't to that wound that we look to be healed, but 
I do not know what Arthur's last thoughts or words were, but I want to share with you what my Lord's last words and thoughts were. St. Luke tells us, as the Lord of the universe who loved Arthur and was united to him in baptism, saw those who were mocking him and caused him the worst pain, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That word of forgiveness seems absurd on the face of it. Why forgive those who are killing you? Who are hurting you? That word is what Jesus gives. It's the word of one who knows us more intimately than anyone could ever know. For Jesus not only has experienced the depths of human depravity, but knows every one of us in our hearts. For as St. John says, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus knows us all too well. Like a parent with an unruly child, he sees through the tantrum and to the core, and looks upon all of us, not in judgment, but in love. From the one who stretched out, stretched out a nail to a cross, these words are of the greatest magnitude of importance. They're the last will and testament of the one who came to save us from our madness. He does so with mercy. Jesus knew Arthur even before his baptism. But through that baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Arthur became something more. Well, those last months do not define our dear father, brother, friend, and companion. They do cause us the anxiety we have today. Let me tell you, the words of Jesus spoke from the cross are for all of us. He still speaks them in the midst of our madness. For Arthur, he tells him again, Father, forgive him. He knows not what he does. We can believe Jesus at his word. We can trust his promise. We can have hope. A word given to Arthur. A word of forgiveness and love. A word that gives our dear loved one he needs more than anything. This word of mercy is for you too. St. Catherine of Siena once said, wherever I look, mercy. Oh, mad lover of man. Mercy, mercy, mercy. If we see anything, it is mercy from our Lord, mercy for Arthur and for us. Surely God is mercy itself. And in our pain, in Arthur's pain, he gives it. He gives it without end. It's my prayer that his mercy comes to each of you today. Mercy from the torment of the cross and the depths of our wantonness. Mercy from the heart of the one open to each of you. Mercy from the one who knows us in our most inward parts. May mercy today, the promised forgiveness that our Lord gives, May it heal your hearts and may it bless your memories, Arthur. No matter who you are, may we all see Arthur with eyes of mercy. May we each continue to show the mercy towards each other we all need today, and every day when our wounds are opened again. Our Father in heaven forgives us, forgives those whom his son claims as his own. That includes brother Arthur. We can hope above all people because Christ is risen. His mercy is certain. So will Arthur one day to rise and hear the words spoken for him anew. Amen. Arthur Lee, beloved father, brother, son, professor, and friend, passed away on February 20th, 2022 at age 59 survived by his beloved children, Bill and Christine, as well as his mother, Teresa, and his younger sisters, Annette and Andrew. His uh, predeceased by his father, King K. Arthur grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and earned a BS in Geosciences from Penn State University in 1985, an MS in Geology from Temple University in 1990, and a PhD in Geology from the University of Southern California in 1994. <coughs> Arthur joined the faculty of Roan State Community College in Oak Ridge, Tennessee in 2000. He was a beloved and tenured professor and dedicated teacher, earning the highest praise from his many students. His passion for education and for geology was contagious. 
that is true. And his devotion to his students unparalleled, false. As just one example, Arthur helped to bring to life a program called a Lab in a Box, a hands-on approach to science for middle school students. Arthur also taught inmates at Morgan County Correctional Complex, driving there twice each week, once to deliver a three-hour lecture and to facilitate the lab session. Arthur will be remembered as a lover of the Beatles, a loyal friend who truly saw and sought the best in others, an endlessly curious mind, and a loving father family is, again, sincerely grateful to the many friends who have given us support and comfort during this time of loss. A special thank you to Roan State for hosting today's services. We now have some sharing from family, friends, and colleagues. Let's introduce his friend, John. Speaking is not my forte. I don't want to talk about the Arthur that I knew. Most of the people in this room, can you hear me okay? Am I speaking loud enough? Okay. Most of the people in this room know him from the academia side, I'm sure. Except for the family. One of their friends like me that are outside the college. You have to have brains to go to college, and that ain't that I ain't got. I met Arthur at the Carm thrift store down the road. We almost literally ran into each other. He's coming around the uh, end of the aisle, and I was going the other way, and it almost was a catastrophe. But we were talking about the things that we had discovered there, and the things we keep discovering there. This led to an exchange of phone numbers, and finally to uh, our having uh, breakfast or lunch. Um, first at Panera Bread, and then at IHOP almost every weekend for a full year. So I got to know him that way. Uh, I would bring things to show him, show and tell. I mean, taking it to a professor, to show and tell. Uh, an antique camera here, uh, a Mission Impossible style three inch reel to reel tape recorder there. He thought that was cool. And one day I came across this. <laughs> which he got a real kick out of. Now, I love geology. I never pursued it out of high school. I always wanted to. Uh, and I would ask him questions. You ask Arthur a question about a rock, and you're going to get a 30-minute discourse to come away with knowing all there is to know about that rock. And I know that right now he's up there going, Lord, you know what this rock I just found? Let me tell you about it. No, I know, Arthur. I, I, I created it. No, let me tell you this. I think I gave you grace, okay? Arthur was a passionate passionate person. You're going to hear that throughout this. He's passionate about his students. In and out of the classroom. It doesn't matter who you were. Also, not only here, but the prison that he went to teach at, it takes a lot of courage to go into a place that has potentially hardened criminals and try to give them an alternative other than being a criminal. I couldn't do it, and I'm military. Forget it. He was passionate about his kids. He talked about you two constantly. I feel that I know you, I knew you before I met you, which was only a couple days ago. He was passionate about his country, about the direction it's going. We had the same views on that. In fact, we were both wonderfully and completely politically incorrect. Thank you very much for proud of that. <laughs> Anybody here at Roan State is fortunate enough to have had him in the classroom, but he was fortunate in you because from what I gathered from him, this is not only an institute of learning, but also a family. And he had a great love for the family. There's not a whole lot more that I could say, except I would like to read one thing, if you don't mind. I'm going to take another minute. I mean, we're going to be here six, seven hours, right? <laughs> it's a poem that I found. Some of you may have read it on his Facebook page. It's by someone named Michael Kuhnliff. Song of a Gentleman. To me, this is Arthur. To be big and tall and strong, to be dominant, I do not long. I want to be inspired. I want to fall in love and then keep on falling. 
I want to step outside. Feel the soil between my fingers, how appropriate, and hear birdsong calling. I long for the silence of a sunset, to feel twilight upon my face. I want to seek out joyful times in safe, welcoming places. I want to trade worries for cares and breathe poetry as fresh air. I need to live a life of peace, a life that will gently weave around the people I meet, a web of hopes and dreams. This was Arthur. You all have been privileged. I wish you well. We will get through this. He's up there laughing right now going, get over it, guys. We'll live your lives. And don't forget to pick up a rock or two. Start a rock band. I thank you for your indulgence. My con dearest condolences. But my joy at meeting you, both of you, and your family. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from his friend, Sam O'Dell. That's going to be hard to follow. OK, so um, <clears throat> every time that I saw Art, and that's when we were saying goodbye, he would say, you're my good friend. And I would say, you're my good friend, too. So I thought I'd say a few words about my good friend. Art and I met on one of my first days of Rome State. I went into the auditorium and looked for anyone that I might know, and I know I look lost. So I heard this voice say, are you new here? Take a seat. So I sat down, and he introduced himself, and I said, well, we go by Arthur or by Art. He said either was fine, so I called him Art. And it was some months before I found out that I'm the only one who called him. <laughs> um, he said that he was a geologist, and I said, well, as long as you're not a chemist, it's all good. <laughs> and we had our first laugh over that comment. And I knew within minutes that I wanted to be good friends. He had an openness about him, and he struck me as a fundamentally decent man. And that impression was confirmed time and time again. You didn't have to worry about what he was thinking. He'd come right out and tell you. And it, even if he thought you needed some advice. But sometimes, but it was always okay even hearing hard things from him because he was always coming from a place of kindness and concern. He was a top notch. And I, I, I do envy those of you who took a class with him. We worked together on a couple of summer teacher education grants. And I got to see him work close up with elementary and middle school uh, educators. And his passion for geology was just a man. And his professionalism and his personality was just on full display as he was doing so. So every question that he got from, from these teachers, and I will tell you all that, elementary school teachers are scared to death of science. So he would set them at ease, and every question would be taken seriously, and y'all know it was answered completely. And uh, he just did a beautiful job. He could walk into a room with a rock and make it into a classroom. And, and I'll, I'll profess to some jealousy at that because um, I would tell him, you know, you can pick up a rock on the side of the road, but I teach anatomy. They don't have hearts on the side of the road. But you can teach a lesson. So, um, the last time that we talked, I told him that I really wanted to go with him on one of his geology outings, and he said it'd be great. I'm sad I'll never be able to do that. So speaking of the last time that we talked, this is what we normally did. We'd go up to the Buffalo Mountain Grill, and if, you, if any one of y'all knew him, you knew that was one of his big hangouts. And the first thing he did was to, he would always talk about his kids, Bill and Christine, and how proud he was. And I would talk to him about my nieces and nephews, and we would talk about relationships. And the last time that we were, were, we were together, we talked about a special someone who we'd met and how the four of us need to get together sometime. And we talked about politics, and as with every time, we had the world's major problems wrapped up in 30 minutes or less. But really what we talked about was less important than the fact that we just got to hang out and enjoy each other's company. He was excited about the class that he was teaching. 
he talked about a couple of grants he was working towards this summer and said there might be a need for a biologist around. I'm like, hey, right here, I'd love to do that. Um, and we parted as friends really should, telling each other what good friends we were and thinking about the next time we could get together during a heavy semester. Um, I've already missed him because rocks are always going to remind me, are always going to remind me. So I drive from Morristown to Pass four days a week to the Walker Street. And there's a, a lot of rocks around right along the drive. And almost every time, there's a couple of people that I've asked, and I was like, I'm going to get Mark out and let him tell me about this. And more specifically, I kind of wanted to know um, if those spots are a good place to find where we can find fossils, which is where geology and biology intersect. That's something we can really like to discuss. Um, well, now I think about, now I drive past him and I think about how I'm doing this. And I, I want to say this. Um, and this is a little off the cuff, and I hope it's, I hope it's not reaching. Um, I'm no, not faculty here anymore. And how Roan State commemorates is not the cuff. But um, I hope it's not out of line to suggest that in addition to a tree, that you find a massive rock. And, and put it on campus with all kinds of interesting looking layers. And um, of course, his passion was geology. And I think it's really appropriate that there's a big rock on campus that other geologists can take their students to and um, can speak about it. And Arthur's Rock has got a pretty nice one. OK. So, his friends and especially his family, my deepest condolences. Um, we've all lost him far too soon. And the world is a little less bright without a minute. So I wanted to thank you and Ron for helping to organize the service. And I know he would have been deeply appreciative of everyone's kindness and fondness for him. And thank you for allowing me the honor of speaking about a friend and colleague who I was lucky to know. I agree. Um, I've got one last thought that I wanted to share. Art was more certain of his beliefs than I am, but I hope he's the right. And if there's more after this life, then you know that he's enjoying the rewards that come to me. I've never heard there are rocks in heaven, but if there are, he knows all about them. Diane Ward. I'm blessed to serve as Chief Academic Officer and Vice President for Run State, and I'm blessed to call Arthur Free. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next three speakers from Run State that will speak about Arthur, tell stories about our colleague and our dear friend. The first one will be Dr. Sylvia Pastor. Dr. Pastor, uh, Sylvia as we call her, um, has worked many years with Arthur on Lab in a Box. Uh, Arthur was also her mentor to take her through the 10-year process, and I'm sure there's many stories, whether she'll share those or not, as Arthur led her through that process, and I think maybe she led him through the Lab in a Box uh, process. The next one will be Gary Heidinger. Gary is Run State's most senior faculty member, and he represents the best of us. He's known Arthur since Arthur came to Run State. They shared uh, offices on the same floor, on the same campus, and shared a passion for students and for teaching that everyone here at Run State shares. So Gary will share those stories with you. And finally, we'll end with our president, Dr. Chris Whaley, who also has known Arthur since he first came, since that very first interview when Arthur came to Run State and accepted the position. So with that, I introduce Dr. Sylvia Patsford. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about my dear colleague and friend Arthur. Um, we'll start from the beginning. Um, Arthur and I were colleagues in the math science division since 2016 when I started teaching for Bone State. 
in my first semester, I taught eight three or three hour labs each week. And for my Tuesday night lab, Arthur and I were among several faculty sharing a lab in the Goff building. I was surprised to find a Mac in the classroom and heard it was likely because I was sharing the classroom with Dr. Lee. That was interesting and unique. I was teaching organic chemistry and my students' glassware had to be absolutely clean and dry. The reagents had to be added with care if they were to even hope of having some of the best reactions proceed. Each week, as I went to prepare the whiteboard for the pre-lab, a new collection of rocks and minerals greeted me on the instructor's table at the front of the room. That was interesting. Students would sometimes note that their lab bench had dirt on it. The rock people were here. <laughs> but we would joke about the rock people. As the year went on, I learned about and began to coordinate the Lab in a Box program. Little did I know that one of the three boxes I would be deploying to 27 rural schools in East Tennessee was a fossils kit designed by Arthur Lee. That was his third Lab in a Box kit he had designed. Each summer, we would coordinate sessions for middle school teachers to train them on the kits. I would sit in on Arthur's sessions, and the teachers and I were learning and trying to decide if given fossils were benthic on the ocean floor, nectonic, the swimmers, plantonic, the floaters, or terrestrial on land. I learned about protozoa, periphera, bryozoa, brachiopoda, palesopoda, gastropoda, selectopoda, trilobita, echino dermata, and chordata, along with a handful of others I can't even hope to pronounce appropriately. Even just reading these names, I hear Arthur's voice saying them as he taught the teacher about each of the fossils that he had uniquely selected for this collection to go to our middle school. He was excited as a kid in a candy store. He was always great with the teachers and a pleasure to work with. And when the pandemic hit in the summer of 2020, his kit was the only one we deployed that summer because I knew he and I would work together despite masks or social distancing or any other challenges we were faced with. This summer, I did not know would be the last time we conducted our training together, but it was probably one of the most memorable. We were able to train on and deploy kit, including the last of our 27 fossils, robotics, and physics kit. And to accomplish this, we scheduled two training days in one week one in Harriman and one in La Follette. We ran different sessions in two different rooms each day and the logistics were tricky but doable. The Harriman training on Tuesday went off without a hitch. The day of the La Follette training, I spent the morning in the main room right off the lobby leading a, a physics slash friction kit for Philip who was off to New York to move his daughter again. <laughs> um, meanwhile, our Oak Ridge High School robotics team was in the lab working with other teachers. We broke for lunch and enjoyed some socializing. And as the time approached to begin the afternoon session, which was to include Arthur on the fossils, Arthur was not on campus. He called me to ask what room we were in. Sheer panic crossed over my body. There was no way Arthur was in La Follette at our Campbell County campus. If you have ever been to that campus, it is small. It has one building. You could not miss the sign-in table and the room full of people to your right as soon as you came through the lobby doors. Arthur was in Harriman. <laughs> he looked down at the fossils kit he was carrying and read the note with a reminder on the top front of me about the days and locations. He offered to drive up, but we both knew it would take more than an hour. But suddenly we solved the problem together. He would hop in a Zoom room. So thanks to the pandemic, without missing a beat, we got a Zoom meeting started and he trained the teachers remotely. As a special bonus, I have that recording of him doing that training from them. We have trained dozens of middle school teachers over the last several summers. He was funny and approachable. He was knowledgeable and enthusiastic about geology. As Diane mentioned, for the last few years, Arthur served as my mentor in the faculty tenure process. He took the checklist from our then Dean Marcus Pomper and we checked off the boxes. He did classroom observations for me, met to discuss my progress, and we attended a faculty senate meeting together. He was a great listener. And one of the things that always struck me was how he was always curious about what I was doing in the classroom. And he would consider if he could adopt those practices into his classroom, even though he was so much more senior. Also, he would always jump in and support me. 
when we had National Chemistry Week and the theme that year was Chemistry Rocks, he gave a presentation for my students at the start of our lab that week. When our chemistry club went on a field trip this summer to the new K-25 History Museum, he came along. He was helpful, he was supportive, he was easy to get along with. This February, the committee of our tenured math science faculty met and looked over all of us who were up for tenure. He was there and I know he supported me. In fact, I talked to him on Valentine's Day when I learned that the meeting had gone well. I thanked him for serving as my mentor in that process and through the pandemic, and that was the last time we spoke. This summer, Arthur had a fantastic trip to the Greek island. He was hoping we could work together to develop an international trip as part of our Rome State study abroad. He wanted our Rome State students to see the amazing geochemistry that he saw. He was not only enthusiastic, it was contagious, and he loved to share his knowledge with others. He was a beloved friend, family member, part of the Rome State Community College faculty and family for over 21 years. And he was dedicated to helping the community and the region. Arthur, I will miss you, and I'm grateful for the time we had together here at Rome State. To the family and to others mourning, thank you for sharing him with us and my deepest sympathies to all of you. Thank you. Good morning. What can I say about Dr. Arthur Lee? You've all heard what an outstanding instructor he was. Devoted to his craft, to his subject matter, and above all, to his students. He was also a truly good person. Genuine. One of the things I liked about Arthur, few pretenses, what you saw is what you Furthermore, he was as good a friend as anyone could ever hope. Very special. My youngest son, Logan, had the good fortune to complete physical geology under Arthur's direction. He repeatedly told me how much he enjoyed the class, and how impressed he was as to Arthur's knowledge and deep appreciation of the subject matter of geology. He told me that Arthur had this remarkable ability to captivate, hold the attention of his students while presenting complex information in a straightforward, understandable, and very entertaining manner. A week or so after Logan completed the class, Arthur came by my office and he sat down and went into great detail about how impressed he with my son's knowledge, with his commitment to the class, what a great student he was, and how impressed he was by this young man. I'm gonna tell you, as a father, these kind of compliments coming from Dr. Arthur Lee, that's as good as it is. <laughs> and to me, he was the quintessential colleague. You know, the one you hope to encounter one you hope to be working with in your workplace. At the same time, he had this wondrous ability, truly wondrous, to brighten an otherwise dark time. I sometimes had those days when I felt I had a lot on my plate. That I was between that, you know, proverbial rock and a hard place. And I would encounter Arthur with that literally unique smile. You remember the one from the photograph? Almost impish. And he had this really contagious sense of humor. And I always came away refreshed and recharged. And for me too, he was truly a renaissance person. I don't think there was any topic or issue he didn't have some interest in. And he and I had numerous conversations, literally ranging from human evolution, politics, religion, and eventually always got around the cars. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to cars, Arthur was born to it. Uh, I 
truly can envision him fitting neatly into the car culture of my late adolescence and early adulthood. You know, late 1950s, yep, I'm that old, and 1960s. In my high school, he would have been one of the cool kids, cruising around in a 1955, 1959, Ford or Chevy, V8, four barrel carburetor, two door hard top, lowered rear end, skirts over the back tires. I could also envision him behind the wheel, one of those 1960s, early 1970s muscle cars with a screaming Hemi engine. I will never forget, never the excitement and the pride he exhibited when he introduced me to his brand new Mini Cooper. And I came across Myra Angelou's poem, When Great Trees Fall. It's a wonderful and eloquent and meaningful discourse into the grief that we all feel when someone special in our lives dies. I'm not going to read the whole poem. It consists of five stanzas. In the first poem, she likens the death of a loved one or a friend, whom she calls great souls, to the fall of a great tree in the forest. Its collapse has an impact that spreads far and wide. To me, that's Arthur's death. It is impacts everyone who knew this very, very special person. And she points out in the poem, in the early stanzas, that the accompanying grief can cause a griever to hunker down, to seek a place of security. She also goes on to highlight that the griever, due to the power and the influence of grief, sometimes struggles to even grieve. And that grief alters the griever's sense of reality, what some call their assumptive work, leaving them feeling insignificant, producing a variety of powerful emotions, in particular, despair. As she puts it, as if we are reduced to the unutterable ignorance, dark, cold days. But it's the fifth stanza that I'm going to read, that provides a true sense of hope. Angelou notes, a period of peace blooms, healing, yes, even joy. Although there will be pain, the memories of the one who has died are still very much with us. That person remains present in our lives, but has shifted from physical presence to remembrance. That, she asserts, can assist any griever in creating a new and meaningful purpose to their lives. I think she is highlighting a fundamental truth. Death ends a life, not a relationship. This is the fifth stanza. And when great souls die, and Arthur was truly, truly a great soul, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly, spaces fill, fill with a kind of electric vibration, our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they exist. Arthur, my friend, we're all better because you exist. My condolences to his wonderful family. Please know he loved you all here. Thank you very much, Gary, and to everyone who has spoken and who will speak. Um, I want to thank you, uh, say thank you to the Lee family for true honor of being able to honor Arthur's memory. This is really important.
important that special events. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Um, thank you to Arthur's friends, uh, including, importantly, his colleagues, his Rome State family. You've already heard that term used before. Um, I, I smile not because I don't have uh, a hurt right here, because I do, but I can't think of Arthur without a smile. I just can't, I just can't think of it without a smile. Um, John Steinbeck said, I have come to believe that a great teacher is a great artist. Teaching might even be the greatest of the arts, since the medium is the human mind and spirit. And surely there can be no doubt that Dr. Arthur Lee was a great teacher, one of the greatest. How do I know that? Well, several things. Arthur cared deeply about his students. You've already heard uh, a bit about that. He cared about his colleagues. He was not only willing to help, he was delighted to help. Anytime you ask for Arthur's help, he was delighted to help, to go with you, to, to see what he could do. He turned care into action more times than I can possibly count or relate to. He would often say, I won't let you down, and he wouldn't. Arthur cared about his country. You've already heard he served as a veteran. In his own words, he wrote once, I was in the ROTC. That's how I paid my way through college. I, started as a private E1, I finished as an E3, and was offered the position of second lieutenant if I went full time, but I turned it down to go to graduate school. You see, I had just started my master's degree in geology. And so needless to say, Arthur cared deeply about geology. He wanted others to care deeply about geology. He would find rocks, as you've heard, on the side of the road, on trails, in fields, in caves, on campus, in parking lots, you get the idea. Literally everywhere would become his classroom. He would use those examples, those samples, to explain and share his love of geology with his students. He continually asked us for funding so he could take students on field trips to search for rocks, right, Diane? Uh, and he would also ask always for money to feed the students, which I always thought was really he loved to have tours of high school students or others come in and visit his classes uh, or his labs so while he was in the middle of teaching. So far from being perturbed for being interrupted, Arthur would light up and he would excitedly describe to the students what his class was studying and why it was important to know the history of our earth. It was evident that these opportunities truly were the highlight of his day. And as you've heard, Arthur cared about teaching and no, that's not even the right way. You have to just say the truth. Arthur loved to teach. Nothing seemed to light him up inside the way teaching did. It was, it was within him. It, it, it bubbled up inside him, and then it overflowed outside of him and got on you and got on anyone that was around him. He could not contain his passion to teach. As Sylvia mentioned he was one of the first to develop a lab in the box curricula to help middle school teachers and to, their students to understand and, in, uh, and enjoy geology. As you've heard, he was always willing to teach classes at the Morgan County Correctional Facility. Those students, by the way, are going to get to see a taped version of this uh, service, which, for which we're very thankful. Um, the only slight hitch about uh, getting Arthur into the correctional facility had nothing to do with his willingness to go. It was that he was so excited to go, he'd often forget that he wasn't allowed to take his lighter in with him. That's contraband in the prison. And so uh, Dr. Ward would get calls from the warden more perturbed each time. Diane, this is a problem. Please tell him to leave his lighter in the car. <laughs> Diane, this is the warden. Please tell him to leave his lighter in the car. <laughs> Arthur would volunteer to go to satellite campuses to offer students classes in person because he wanted to be there with them in person to make sure uh, that they were learning, that they could catch his uh, contagious nature uh, and his love for his field. And, and folks, we've talked about how much he cared, but you need to know, family needs to know, I think you already do, but you need to understand how much his students cared for him. Gary shared uh, about Logan, and I, I can't begin to tell you how many students, current and former, that we have heard from who have all expressed their gratitude to 
and their love for him, this outpouring. The students at Morgan County Correctional Facility um, showed their care and respect so much that they made a card to send uh, to the family with words about Arthur, and it's one of the most touching gifts I've ever seen in all my life. Teachers that he trained during Lab in a Box loved and respected him. In fact, uh, during one training at the Oak Ridge Branch campus, this is, this is a different uh, a time than, than Sylvia relate. During a training at the Oak Ridge Branch campus, um, uh, Diane got a little concerned because Arthur wasn't there yet. And he called to say, what, what room are you in? And she told him, and he, there was silence, and he said, is that on the Roan County campus? And she said, no, Arthur, we're at the Oak Ridge Branch campus. And he said, no problem, no problem. I'll be there in a few minutes. And Diane said, it's going to take you more than a few minutes to, to get here, Arthur. Be safe, but I'll, I'll stall. So she stalled for him in worrying that this was really early on, that these teachers might then take out, you know, displeasure or, or whatever on, on, on him during the, the evaluation at the end. Well, she needn't have worried about that. He made it in record time came through the door teaching, literally hit the door, already in mid-stride, talking about the rock that was in his hand, and he ended up with some of the highest evaluations that we've ever had during Lab and Law School. So, suffice it to say, Arthur was a master teacher, and just like the Steinbeck quote said, he absolutely was an artist. Two other quotes uh, that I found that I thought were really appropriate, Pauline Wilcox said, teaching is the greatest act and Isadora Duncan said, I do not teach students, I give them joy. Folks, weren't both of those things absolutely true about Arthur Lee? And I'll leave you with this, Jessica Unsaker, uh, Arthur's former student and current colleague here at Hunstead, said Arthur Lee was a wonderful person, an amazing educator, and a tremendous friend to everyone who had the pleasure of knowing him. And I'm blessed to get to count myself again to the family. Thank you for sharing this dear, dear person. Next we have Arthur's sister, Angela. Four. Four sister, Natalie. I didn't make one. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I like the word around. My apologies, I have the old version. <laughs> Big change. Thanks. Thank you all for coming today. The fact that you're here today means that your life intersected in some way with Professor Arthur Lee, the geology professor. And to be honest, I might be a little jealous of you in a way because I never really knew that Dr. Lee. Um, by the time he was Professor Arthur Lee, our lives had gone in very separate ways. We both had careers and kids, and we lived very far apart. So we saw each other at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, and we talked whenever there were important family events like weddings and funerals. And I always assumed that there would be plenty of future opportunities to catch up. But I want to share with you a little bit of the Arthur that I knew or he was the professor of Lee that you knew. So Arthur Carson Lee came into this world on December 20th, 1962. And that was just before Christmas and the baby was not due for another month. So my parents hadn't bought a crib yet and he started life sleeping in a drawer. And I wasn't there, but I am told that he was a very shy and gentle toddler, and he had my parents all to himself for three years and three days. And then I arrived in December of 1965, and allegedly I was a pretty feisty, rambunctious, and bossy little sister, which is probably not what Arthur would have ordered, but he stepped up and graciously decided to protect me whenever he thought that I was being bullied. Now, bullying was not all the time, but we went to an elementary school that was 99% white, and that was pretty much divided evenly between Italian and Jewish. And it was 1% Arthur and me. So the bullying wasn't a never event either. And Arthur was 
fairly shy and quiet and um he really didn't always stand up for himself but he was not afraid to stand up to somebody bigger than himself when he knew he was about to get his butt kicked he felt that somebody was picking on his little sister arthur had some deep and loyal friendships from childhood and i want to share with you something that was written to me in a note from his childhood best friend his friend was named Kevin Leto, and Kevin wrote to my family to share some of his childhood memories. Kevin is now the founder of a very prestigious law firm, a graduate of Yale University Law School, but at one time, Kevin was a little blonde-haired kid who looked like Dennis the Menace. And Kevin and Arthur were like Batman and Robin. Arthur was my best friend from my earliest memories until we moved away at the end of third grade, and I never replaced that friendship. Arthur was older and wiser, and he was curious and introduced me to many things, including things I still enjoy, like superhero comic books and stamp collecting. Arthur was our leader. He loved to share whatever he learned, and he had a great imagination. I can understand why he was an important teacher to so many students. Kevin Lee. So overall, it was a pretty good time to be growing up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey in the late 60s and early 70s. This was a time where every summer day you would run out the door after breakfast and our little pack of kids would roam the neighborhood and go from house to house, play capture the flag and eat all the popsicles in somebody's mom's freezer and chase the ice cream truck and then catch fireflies and your parents had no idea what you were but they didn't worry and finally when it was dinner time and getting dark they would yell for you out the back door and you would come home and arthur was always the leader of our little gang and he was this incurable optimist and sometime he would lead our little gang on organized missions to walk two or three miles to the 7-eleven and decide what candy we all should buy with our collective pooled three or four dollars and then he would decide what we should eat and in what quantity and in what order. <laughs> and this one time, I, I think I was five and he was about eight. So he decided that there was treasure buried in our backyard in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And to conceal this treasure, someone had cleverly put a concrete pad in back of our house and then placed a central air conditioning unit on top to prevent anyone from digging. So with Arthur supervising our excavation crew, which now included five-year-old me, his best friends Kevin and Brian, and Kevin's brother, we got my dad's garden tools and decided to dig a deep hole underneath the concrete pad. And it actually got deep enough for a whole kid to bodily climb into. And luckily for us, I think at this point, Kevin's dad or somebody wandered by, saw the oh. hole, which was deep enough for the air conditioning unit to fall in and crush a kid and yelled at us stupid kids to fill in the damn hole before somebody got killed. <laughs> Later in high school, Arthur saved up all his money and he bought a metal detector. And he scoured all the parks and backyards in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, looking for a buried treasure. And maybe that's where he got his lifelong passion for searching for fossils and rocks. This was Arthur. He always thought that there was buried treasure, and if you could just find it. And he was like that with people, too, because he usually always saw the best in people, even to a fault. And sometimes he thought that even if people couldn't see it in themselves, deep down inside of everyone, there was a good person. The last time I saw my brother in person was just before Christmas last year. And it was the first time in a long time that we really talked about where we were in our lives and our childhoods and our father who had died two years ago. And he shared some of the things that meant the most to him in life. He said he didn't really care about money. He cared about his children and how important it was to him to be a good father and how much he loved teaching and how proud he was that his students considered him to be a good professor. And I'm grateful that we had that conversation. And I always thought we would have more of those in the future. So when Arthur went missing in February, I was actually out of the country for a few months. And I, I wasn't aware that he was having health issues. 
And it wasn't until Arthur disappeared that I learned a lot of things about my brother that I never knew. And I went on Facebook and I saw hundreds of notes of concern from his friends and neighbors and his community. And I read all these touching messages that his students had posted about him and parents of his students, and students that had taken his class years ago. And I thought about how touched my brother would be if he knew how deeply his friends and neighbors and his community cared about him and how lucky his students were to have had a professor that really cared about them and really cared about teaching. Because I've had a lot of professors in my life, brilliant professors, great researchers, but I can tell you that the love of teaching and the desire to make a personal connection with your students is truly a rare gift. So our mother has always been the epitome of being able to find silver lining every black cloud. So as an aside, I can give you an example. Our 87-year-old our mom was in the ICU for several days before Christmas because she had a near-drowning incident when she decided to go snorkeling. And after spending three or four days in the ICU, she said to my sister, it's a good thing that this happened. I'm so lucky because I got to spend this time in the hospital, and then I got to spend this time talking to you. Because my mom always thinks that it was a great lucky incident. So in the spirit of finding a silver lining, she felt the most constructive way to remember Arthur's legacy would be to establish a scholarship to help fund the education for a deserving and promising student at this institution because it was his home for over 20 years. And so we hope that the scholarship that has his name on it can help carry his memory and help, help Arthur to continue to educate the students at Rowan State because that was his life's work. So we want to thank you for coming today to remember my brother for his endless optimism and his ability to see the best in everyone and his quest for the buried treasure that was out there to be found. And in remembrance of Arthur, Please do what I wish that I had done and reach out and call or text somebody that you care about and maybe you haven't spoken to in a while that you think that you have plenty of time to catch up with in the future, but then maybe again you won't. Thank you. Lower the microphone even more. Uh, good morning. I am Arthur's younger, youngest sister, uh, almost eight years younger than Arthur, and that means that we spent only 10 years under the same roof, because I was just a little girl when Arthur went off to college. To be honest, my memories are few and a little blurry. The one thing Arthur and I shared in common is choosing to become a professor, a teacher. When thinking about how important that was for Arthur and how important his students were to him, I got to be thinking about a homework assignment that I like to give my students. It's called the gratitude letter. This is how it works. Basically, a gratitude letter is a letter that you write to someone that you have never properly thanked. You thank them for what they've done for you in your life. I wrote my gratitude letter to Arthur too late. He's not here to hear it. I wish he were, but you're here. And he loved you. And each and every one of you meant something very special to him. So today, I'd like to read to you what I wrote for my brother. Dear Arthur, by the time I could walk, you were becoming a teenager. So it's no surprise we didn't do a lot of hanging out. I do have a few memories I will cherish forever. I remember hearing the Beatles music in your room spilling out from under your door, from your record player. Not just the songs everybody knows and loves and plays all the time, but all the B-side songs. All the songs that George and Ringo wrote. <laughs> and you apparently appreciated just as much as the songs that Paul and John wrote. 
you were no sports fan, but whenever there was a football game playing, you reflexively rooted for the underdog. Later in life, when we were both grown up, I remember you were so much better than I was at taking the perspective of the good people who, for sheer bad luck, lived lives that were less fortunate. Truly, Arthur, you treated every single person you met equally, respecting them as individuals, with no regard for station or status. I remember once saying to myself, I remember saying to myself more than once, my brother is kind. I remember the year dad and mom splurged on a tropical cruise vacation. I think I was about five, that puts a net at about nine, maybe 10, you were 13 or 14. You were at the peak age for pulling pranks. And you're right, you really did have a great sense of humor. Annette and I were old enough to be your willing accomplices. We all thought we were so very clever for thinking to push all of the buttons in the elevator so that when we sprinted up and down the stairs just ahead, we could watch the doors of the elevator slowly open and then close on every floor with its cargo of increasingly impatient and frustrated passengers. That was so fun. We then figured out how to race ahead of the elevator and just push the call button so that every floor the mystified passengers would stop and train their heads outside and see no one. But because we've hidden ourselves around the corner, we got a great laugh out of this. I don't know how we kept from laughing and blowing our cover. Those pranks and the maraschino cherries we begged from the bartender and the video arcade we decided was so much more fun than any tropical scenery. To this day, I cannot remember ever having more fun. Once we grew up, Arthur, we settled in different parts of the country, Annette and you and I. We saw each other at Christmas, maybe Thanksgiving. But especially in recent years, you made a point to say you wished we saw each other more. Each time, you would end our conversation and you would say, I love you. And you really meant it. I know you did. Arthur, I know that above all else, you loved your children. I want to thank you for bringing them into the world. Christine is beautiful and smart and full of light. She makes friends faster and easier than anyone I know. She keeps them, too. And if that doesn't say something about your character, I really don't know what does. Christine inherited Popo's artistic creativity, the courage to be her own person, when she wants something, she gets it because she's not afraid to work hard and to take chances. Bill is such a fine young man. He's not just polite, he is truly kind. He is not just capable, he is truly responsible. He is the sort of person you hope is around in times of crisis because when everyone is losing their heads, Bill is able to keep his wits about him. Like you, Arthur, Bill is so very smart and intellectually curious. He is a reader. He is a thinker. And like you, he has an entrepreneurial spirit, a deep desire to be independent and to be creative. So Arthur, thank you for teaching me to appreciate the B-side songs, to root for the underdogs. Thank you for showing me how important it is to treat people with the respect that they deserve. And most of all, and I've had a good example of this because I had a very special aunt and uncle in my own life, thank you for making me Auntie Angie and for making our sister Auntie Annette the most two wonderful children. Thank you very much. Oh, you're okay. And I had the right bullets in my eyes just now because they used to. Sorry, Annette. There we go. Now we hear from Arthur's son, Bill Lee. 
<laughs> I am Arthur Sun. Um, I would like to thank all of you for being here today to celebrate the life of my father. It is endearing to know that he has not only made a profound impact on my family and I, but also to the thousands of students he has taught over the years and to much of the Oak Ridge community in general. Um, the outpouring of support and love that I've seen from the community here has been staggering, and our family is truly grateful for each and every one of you. I will most remember him by his sense of humor, a sense of humor many would find eccentric. Um, he was a big fan of British humor, and uh, he was the one that got me into Monty Python when I was a kid. <laughs> Um, he had this uncanny ability to do like a, a variety of accents and like voice impressions um, from like British to German to French accents. He even got the Southern Twain down pat um, despite being a Jersey boy originally. Um, I always admired his ability to morph the tone of his voice to whatever he wanted since I've always thought my voice would be a little bit monotone and a bit robotic. Um, some of the values he espoused to my sister and I throughout our lives were the importance of education, family above all else, and having a solid moral compass, uh, which meant always doing the right thing no matter what. He used to tell me this story um, when he was a kid, how he realized after he got home one time, he received 50 cents extra in change for buying comic books, but his father uh, or, my grand, or my grandfather um, made him go all the way back to the store to return the extra money. He was a big Dave Ramsey fan and uh, taught my sister and I the importance of good money management and budget. I appreciated the fact that he always wanted to spend time with me and bond with me. When I was younger, I was a huge video game nerd. Um, and video, video games were a big part of my life. So he made it a point to play with me in games such as in games such as World of Warcraft, where we could like interact together in a virtual world, despite me being hundreds or even thousands of miles away, since I only spent a small portion of my life here in Tennessee. Um, because I was not nearly as passionate about science as he was, he always made it a point to learn more about what I was interested in, whether that meant trying new foods or learning about cryptocurrency. Um, we both shared a love of traveling, so I'm grateful for the fact that we both were able to explore Greece together uh, last year. Um, I thought it was always funny when he would randomly yell out, Opa, to the waiters or taxi drivers, which is um, actually a term from the Greeks that's used during celebrations or during drinking. Um, but he could never remember how to say the word for thank you, um, which, is, uh, which was uh, eferisto. Um, he always just said feristo every time, <laughs> despite being corrected numerous times. <laughs> My dad was a quirky guy, so I sometimes felt embarrassed to be in public with him. But in hindsight, I realized I wouldn't change a thing about him. The quirkiness added to his charm and his personality. Um, one of my father's, path, uh, one of my father's uh, prouder accomplishments was outside the field of academia. Chris was one of his best friends, um, who some of you may know since he worked in IT here in Rose State um, several years back. They would always argue about whether PC or Mac computers were superior, which I found amusing. Um, Chris was in his like late 50s or 60s at the time and had given up on finding love. My father decided to try setting him up, setting him up with his cousin, Xiao Yuan from China. At first, I didn't think it would work out because they were entirely different people. He was more reserved and kept to himself. She was super talkative and outgoing. He grew up in Tennessee for much of his adult life, while she grew up in China for much her. She grew up in China for much of her adult life. But some. Things somehow clicked together between them and they got married in Gatlinburg, with their anniversary being just about seven years to this very day. 
I believe they're probably watching the live stream from Texas. So um, shout out to Chris and Shao Yun if you're watching. Um, my father was always busy with work and hardly took any time off for himself. Between teaching at the college, um, side activities such as teaching at the prison and the eBay business he had selling items he found from thrift stores. He still found time to call me every week. Um, I will admit that sometimes I hesitated, I hesitated um, picking up his calls because I felt like I was just being lectured most of the time. <laughs> um, as I got older and more mature, I realized he was just doing what dads do and that he was lecturing me out of love. I feel like I took his uh, phone calls for granted um, for much of my adult life. But now I would uh, literally do anything just to have his name show up on my phone screen again. Um, I would give the world, just be able to hug him, have a beer with him, and just talk about life again. I just want to uh, say that we all love and miss you dearly, Dad. And um, I know you'll be watching over me and my sister every day. Thank you to all who shared, especially Arthur's family. Wonderful memories. So many things for us to think about today and to share. So as colleagues and friends, thank you. What we know is a challenge, but a joy because of who we're sharing it about. Family would like to invite you for a reception afterwards uh, that you're all invited to spend time with them today. And I invite you now to join me in the closing. <coughs> Almighty God, we thank you for the life you have given to Arthur. We ask that you be with his family, his children, all those who love him. Surround them this day with your comfort, your love, and your peace. Help us always to keep Arthur and our memories in our hearts. To pray always, Lord, to you. Fond memories of Pray, Lord, for your mercy be in our hearts always. As we speak of him, think about him all the days of our life. Pray especially from our hearts, lift up before you now. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May light perpetual shine upon him. May all the souls, with faith in the heart, rest in God, rest in peace. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.